you have your Bibles with you this morning, I hope you do. I want to encourage you to open them to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, we're going to begin in verse 17. And I want to welcome the venue service meeting right down the hall. And Fellowship Olathe is joining us this morning. Can you give a welcome to Fellowship Olathe joining us this morning? <laughs> Pastor Travis over there was uh, brought the message last week, and they were blessed, and we're grateful to have them join us this morning. And at Reach Church DeSoto, Pastor Ryan's preaching. Isn't that good? So he's bringing the word over there this morning, and we're going to look together at Luke chapter 5. You know, last week we looked at Saul, who we better know as Paul, and Paul would later write in Ephesians chapter 2 that you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now working, the sons of disobedience. Among them too, we all formerly lived, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions made us alive together with Christ for by grace you've been saved and he raised us up and he seated us with him in the heavenly places so that in the ages to come he might show forth the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not as a result of works. So that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. That's Paul's story. That I was dead I was a dead man walking, spiritually speaking, until I met Jesus. And guess what we're going to see this morning? We're going to find another individual that was spiritually dead. He is lame spiritually, a paralytic who has no hope. And yet he's going to have one encounter with Jesus. And he will be forgiven of his sins and he will be fixed made new, a new creation in Christ Jesus. He's going to walk forward in life as a public testimony, demonstration of the power of God. Can anybody identify with that? Amen, that you were dead until you met Jesus and he changed you and he forgave you and your life now became a, a living testimony of the power of God. Well, we're going to see this. Let's watch together. Verse 17, chapter 5 of Luke. One day he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and set him down in front of him, but not find any way to bring him in because of the crowd. They went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus." And seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. And immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And they were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear saying, we have seen remarkable things today. Father, we pray that you would bless the study of your word this morning. We pray that you'd make it alive to us. And God, I just pray if there's anybody in this room, anybody watching online, somebody at Fellowship Olathe that has wandered into a place of hearing your word and they don't know you. God, I pray that they would have an encounter with the living Christ today. By means of your word and the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd bring them to a knowledge 
of the depth of their own sin and a knowledge of who Christ is, and they would be changed today. God, change all of us. Bring us to a greater and deeper understanding of who you are and the salvation you've provided. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to look, first of all, at this um, story. I want us to focus in on the faith of the friends. Uh, Mark, th- th- this is recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this story. And Mark probably gives you the greatest amount of context. Essentially, what you have here is Jesus teaching in a home. We, we don't know whose home it is, but he's teaching inside some house. And obviously, word has spread about this Jesus who is able to heal and perform miracles. And when somebody like that is walking around and you got problems in your life, you want to go see him. So there's a whole lot of people who want to see Jesus. And he finds himself in a home and he's teaching and it's packed. It's standing room only. And there's a group of friends who have another friend who's a paralytic And their heart goes out to him and they've heard about Jesus and their goal is to somehow get him to Jesus. But when they arrive at the house, their hopes are dashed. They quickly realize there's no way we're getting this pallet through that door and there's no way we're getting through that crowd. And all of a sudden, in a moment of clarity, they think to themselves, why not just climb up on that roof? And so they begin to somehow climb up on a roof and lower this man down in front of Jesus. You talk about a crazy idea. But boy, was it effective in getting the attention of Jesus. And really, that's the first thing that sticks out to me in this miracle, is that what really gets Jesus' attention right here is not the paralytic. It's not the hole in the roof. What grabs Jesus' attention is the faith of the friends. It says it the exact same way in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Here in verse 20, you see it right there. It says, seeing their faith, meaning the, the, the faith of the friends. And so here's the principle that I think we're intended to see, that your faith or the lack of faith in your life has the ability and the power to affect the salvation of another individual. That to some extent, the determining factor as to whether or not your friends, your family members, your co-workers will come to faith in Christ will be the quality of your faith. Now, let's be clear here. Everybody has to make a personal decision to follow Jesus. Everybody has to make a personal decision. You can't get to heaven on the basis of your grandmother's faith. You can't get to heaven on the basis of your friend's faith. It's got to be your faith. You've got to make a decision. But what's clear and obvious here is that our faith has a huge impact upon whether or not an individual finds themselves in a position to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And so the question we've got to ask ourselves is what kind of faith does it take to get the attention of Jesus and see our friends and our family members, our coworkers come to faith in Christ? Well, I want us to look very briefly at the quality of these, these individuals' faith. Number one, it was a faith that was driven by concern for the paralytic. I mean, these guys, they they knew the condition of this paralyzed man. They knew that his only hope was Jesus. And they're so concerned about his condition that they actually do something about it. And if we are ever going to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ, it will only occur when our hearts begin to break for the lost condition of the people who are around us. The people that we work with, the people that we go to school with, the people that we live around who are lost and without the hope of Christ. And the truth of the matter is, we know this to be true, that apart from a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they will die and go to a very real and eternal hell. That they are are walking on the edge of an abyss and we have the only means of hope and salvation in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what drove every great missionary movement that we've ever seen. It was individuals who left the comforts of their home and the privilege that they enjoyed and they sacrificed and set out for unknown lands willing to risk their life. Why would they do that? Because they knew there were people out there who are lost and have no gospel witness and if somebody doesn't tell them about Christ, they're going to die and go to hell. 
And they were so moved with concern that they actually did something. And yet statistics tell us that most Christians have never shared Jesus with anybody. And we can make all kinds of excuses as to why we're not telling people about Jesus. But the bottom line is this. If we're not telling anybody about Jesus, it's because, quite frankly, we're just not that concerned about him. That the idea is, well, I got my salvation, and maybe more broadly, I've got my family's salvation, and I don't really care about anybody else. And God help us to have broken hearts for the people who are around us. And to have hearts that are so broken that we're moved to actually do something to open our mouths and speak the name of Jesus. So primarily it was driven by a concern. But secondly, their faith was persistent. I love this about these guys. They won't take no for an answer. What if these guys had shown up to the house, seen the packed room, and said, listen, at least we tried. Let's just go home. If at any point in this story, these guys throw in the towel and walk away, their friend doesn't know forgiveness and he's not healed. If we want to have the kind of faith that grabs the attention of Jesus, the kind of faith that brings people to salvation, we're going to have to have a faith that never stops praying, never stops loving, and never stops sharing. That we don't give up on anybody. That we are persistent. And either the Lord calls us home or they come to faith in Christ, but we're not giving up as long as we got breath in our lungs. That's the kind of faith that moves the heart of Jesus. Thirdly, their faith was creative and risky. These guys are nothing if they're not creative. (laughs) What kind of harebrained idea is this? How do you come up with this stuff? They decide we're going to jump up on this roof, and it was probably a sod roof, which means it was not only creative, it was risky. I mean, they're risking their lives. They're putting their own lives in danger to try to get a man to Jesus. Listen, if we're going to have the kind of faith that leads people to Christ, we're going to have to start getting a whole lot more creative and be willing to take a whole lot more risks. And when I talk about creativity, I'm not talking about being deceitful or subversive or manipulative or deceptive in the gospel message. We just plainly speak the truth of God's word in love. We don't change the method or the the message, but the method and the means, we got to get creative and not be afraid to take some risks. I hear people say all the time, you know, pastor, I'm just not that creative. (laughs) You have been made in the image of God. I think we'd all agree today, God is a pretty creative God. Amen? You've been made in his image. That means you have an unlimited amount of creative potential inside of you. Every one of you. And yet, you know what I found in the church? We're really good at stifling creativity. We don't like people who start coloring outside the lines and try new things. Oh, boy. I found out very early in ministry... (laughs) Whenever you come up with a new idea, there's always five people who've got five reasons why whatever you're trying to do won't work. And you know what I've always said? If I'm going to fail, at least I'm going to fail at a cause that I know will ultimately succeed. Do you realize this? Christ said, I will build my church. Aren't you grateful today that the success of the gospel message, <laughs> message and, and, and mission is not dependent upon your talents and abilities? I said in the first service, I'm glad the the whole mission is not dependent upon my intellect. And there was a little boy in the back who said, amen. (laughs) He knows me. Aren't you grateful? Listen, knowing that Christ said, I'm going to build my church. And knowing that Christ said, I will be with you. Has freed me up to take a whole lot of risks. My goodness, what do we got to lose? So many people are so afraid to do anything that they never do anything. Let's be creative. Let's get risky. (laughs) Because the time is short. These guys were creative. They were risky. Finally, they were sacrificial. 
They sacrificed their time, their comfort, and even their own safety. They were willing to be inconvenienced in the leading of their friend of Christ. There's no way that you can bring people to faith in Christ without some level of sacrifice. It just doesn't happen. Now, as I was saying this, I was reminded of um, a missionary society that wrote to David Livingston. David Livingston was serving in Africa in the remotest parts of Africa. And this missionary society wrote to David Livingston. And they, they said to him, it, if you've found any good roads to where you're at, then we'll send some men who will be reinforcements for you. And Livingston wrote back to, you, to them and said, if you've only got men who will come, if there is a good road, just tell them to stay at home. And to some extent, I think that's the heart of Jesus. We got to be willing to be inconvenienced and sacrificial If you will only involve yourself in the mission when it's convenient, then you might as well stay home. If we're going to see people come to faith in Christ, it'll only occur when God so breaks our heart for the lost that we become the most creative, sacrificial risk takers who will not stop until a person comes to faith in Christ or the Lord calls us home. But you know what most of the time our prayer is? Lord, when it's convenient, could you cause somebody to bump into me and ask me about salvation? (laughs) That's like going fishing and saying, Lord, let them jump in the boat. We got to be intentional, we got to be creative, and we're going to have to be sacrificial. We're missing out on the greatest mission ever given to man. We're missing out on seeing the power of God move through us to touch another person's life. Can I just give you some practical application here, right here? If you don't have the first names of two individuals right now on your mind that are lost and you are regularly engaging with the gospel mission, then you're missing the heart of God in your life. You and God are out of step. Do you realize this is Jesus' master passion? It's the one thing he told us to do. That's it. He didn't make this complicated. The one thing he wants you to do, I don't care who you're working for or what your job is, your number one vocation and mission in life if you're a Christian is to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. And I know this to be true. Most Christians, if they don't start sharing the gospel within the first two years of becoming a Christian, then after that they won't share Jesus with anybody because we're really good in the church at getting you so immersed and busy in the church that you don't have time to engage a lost person. And we got to get out there. Listen, I don't know how much time we have left. God light a fire under us to be intentional about telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ, to be friends like these friends were, and to put ourselves out there. Then I want us to look at the forgiveness of the paralytic. Look in verse 20. It says, friend, and Jesus looks at this guy, friend, your sins are forgiven. I, I picture Jesus kind of getting down on this guy's level. He's obviously a paralytic. He's on the ground. I picture Jesus kind of getting down on his level and looking him in the eye and calling him friend. And I think he's getting excited. This guy, I'm, I'm his friend. And, and I think he's thinking in his mind, he's about to heal me. And I'm going to get up and run around and dance. He's thinking, the one thing I've wanted my whole life is to be able to walk. And it's about to be realized right here. And Jesus looks him in the eye and says, friend, Your sins are forgiven you. And I think his face just dropped. I think he's thinking to himself, that's great, that's nice, but maybe you haven't noticed, I'm paralyzed. Jesus, maybe you didn't notice how I was brought in here. Essentially what he's saying to Jesus, that's great, but my greatest need, the greatest need of my life right now is the ability to walk. And you know the point that Jesus is making to him and the crowd? No, it's not. That is not your greatest need. Your greatest need is not to have the use of your limbs. The greatest need of your life is the forgiveness of your sins. It's the resurrection of your soul. Can I just ask you this morning, what do you perceive as your greatest need? What is your greatest need? What do you perceive to be your greatest need today? Some of you would say, well, you know what my greatest need? It's financial. That if, if I don't get some money, I, I'm, I'm struggling in my life. If I don't get some, some kind of support aid right now, I'm in deep trouble. 
Maybe some of you would say, the greatest need of my life today is relational. Like, I I have some marriage struggles. And you're saying in your heart right now, if God doesn't help my marriage, I'm in in big trouble. Maybe maybe it's a wayward child. Maybe it's a vocational need. It's that, God, if you don't give me a job pretty soon, that's the greatest need of my life. And what you need to learn is what this paralytic's going to learn is that when God begins to deal in our lives, he's not content with simply dealing with the things that we perceive to be our greatest need. You ever heard somebody say, well, if you got your faith that, or, you got, or you got your health, that's all that matters. If you got your health, you're good to go. Listen to me this morning. That's not all that matters. I've seen people who have incredible health, and I wouldn't trade places with them for a moment because their souls are sick. And there's people today that have, they're clinging by a thread, and yet their lives are glowing with the glory and the joy of Christ. Your health is not all that matters. And here's the point. Jesus is telling this man, the greatest need of your life is the forgiveness of your sins. The greatest fear of this man's life is not spending the rest of his life in a paralytic state. That's that's nothing to be afraid of. The greatest fear of his life is someday standing before God without the covering of Christ's blood through faith in him and the forgiveness of his sins. You want to be afraid of something this morning, don't be afraid of losing your job. Don't be afraid of losing your limbs or losing your life. Be afraid of someday standing before God without the shed blood of Jesus Christ covering your sins through faith in him and the forgiveness that's received through faith. That's something to be afraid of. Because eventually this guy, guess what? He's going to die. And he's going to stand before God. And he'll realize his greatest need in that moment. So Jesus gives this man the greatest gift that could ever be given, the forgiveness of the sins. And by the way, if this paralytic left the house on the same pallet that he was lowered in on, if all that he ever received was the forgiveness of his sins, he would have enough to praise Jesus for all eternity. Do you understand that this morning? If God never gives us anything else other than the forgiveness of our sins and eternal salvation, we'd have enough to praise him for eternity. Can I just ask you this morning, why are you coming to Jesus? A lot of people come to Jesus because of some physical need in their life. But Jesus is not content simply dealing with those physical needs. He does care about your physical needs. He's going to demonstrate the care for this guy. But Jesus didn't leave the glory of heaven so that you could have your best best life now. He left the glory of heaven so that you could have the forgiveness of your sins and eternal salvation through faith in him. Well, let's look finally at the frustration of the scribes. Look with me at verse 21. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So the scribes, they're mad because in their mind, only God can forgive sins. And what you see here is that Jesus is claiming divine authority. Jesus is declaring that he is God. But the problem that these men had, it's not with who Jesus is claiming to be. Their problem is is with what Jesus is doing. That Jesus has just offered forgiveness to a man who did absolutely nothing to earn it. There's not much you can do uh, to earn your salvation when you're lying flat on your back paralyzed. This is kind of like the thief on the cross. This man simply turns to Jesus in faith and Jesus forgives his sins. And when your entire system of religion is built upon works and earning your way to God, you tend to get frustrated when somebody starts handing out salvation and forgiveness as a free gift of grace. But that is exactly what Jesus does because salvation has always been a matter of faith. We've been studying Genesis. What does it say? Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Salvation has always been about faith. But for some reason, in the sinfulness of our hearts, we like to feel good about ourselves. And so man has been continually making up systems of religion by which we cooperate with God and contribute to our own salvation. And if that is you this morning, can I just tell you, I got some bad news for you. You can't earn your way to God. 
Even on your best day, your righteous works are like filthy rags in comparison to the holiness of God. If you think that you're going to somehow impress God with your moral resume, can I just tell you this morning, you have too high a view of yourself and you got too low a view of God. He is more holy than you realize and you're more sinful than you realize. But on the other hand, we got some really good news today because Jesus has provided a salvation that is a free gift of grace through faith in him. Jesus knew your sinful condition, knew you couldn't save yourself, so he left the glory of heaven, died on a cross for your sins, rose from the dead. He did all the work, and now you can know that salvation apart from no act of your own except believing in Jesus Christ. Amen? But I'd be willing to bet, if I were a betting man, I'd be willing to bet that there were some, there's some people in this room or watching online that you think you're going to earn your salvation. If I, if I ask you this morning, right now, I want you to think about this right where you see him personally. If you were to die today and you were to stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I allow you to in my kingdom? What's your answer? What's your answer? How are you going to respond to God? There's so many times when we go out of there in the world, we, I ask that question, guess what people start doing? Well, I'm a, I'm a pretty good person and... I've done some good works, and listen, I'm better than the person next to me, and I joined a church. And if your response is anything other than I've trusted in Jesus Christ and he alone is my only hope of salvation, if your answer is anything other than that, then you are trusting in you. God is not some old man with a long white beard sitting on a stool. He is God most high. And there are people that you hear people sometimes say, well, when I I get to heaven and I stand before God, I'm going to start asking him a whole lot of questions. Listen, no, you will not. You will hit your face in light of his glory and the depth of your own sinfulness, and your only hope of salvation will be the blood of Jesus applied to your account through faith. And so this guy is learning, these scribes are learning that salvation is not something you earn, it's something that's received through faith. Well, Jesus isn't done with them. Look in verses 22 through 24. But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. So he looks at him and says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? And obviously to say your sins is forgiven, that's easier. Why is it easier? It's easier because it's not verifiable. There's no way to verify it. Anybody can just go around saying your sins are forgiven, but how would you know? It's a whole lot more difficult to say, pick up your pallet and walk. Why? Because that is verifiable. So Jesus says, just so you know who I am. And just so you know that I have the authority to forgive sins, he looks at the man and says, pick up your pallet and go home. And in verses 25 and 26, immediately he got it before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. And they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. This man is healed, and immediately he's able to pick up his pallet and go home. Now listen, if you... If you If you're paralyzed for a long period of time, what happens to your muscles? They atrophy. So even if somehow the nerves were able to reconnect and whatever else was able to occur, this this man's going to need months and years of rehab. And yet right here, this guy gets up, picks up his pallet, and walks out of the room. This is no ordinary miracle if there is such a thing. (laughs) This is a divinely given miracle that demonstrates Christ's authority that the forgiveness that he, that he gave and he extended to this man is validated through his changed life. That Jesus is essentially saying, if, if I can take a man who is completely lame and restore him in one word, would you also believe that I could take a man who's dead, spiritually speaking, and give him new life 
through faith. And the validation that the internal change had occurred was that the man walked out of the room. Is that not the story of our lives? That the validation that we have received forgiveness, that we've been changed on the inside, is that we walk forward in a new life and a new relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And our lives become a testimony. I love it. It's specific to tell us that he walks out of there with the pallet. Don't you think that guy got some questions down the road? (laughs) Why are you carrying that pallet? Well, let me tell you about a man named Jesus. And his life became a testimony of the grace of God. You see the picture? A man who's dead spiritually, lame spiritually, no hope. He's broken. He has an encounter with Jesus through faith in him. He's forgiven. He's made new. And he walks forward in life as a testimony of the power of God and his grace to forgive through faith. That was Saul's story. That's the paralytic story. Last week you got to hear Glenn Luke's story. I want you to hear this morning from a a young woman named Keevan. Let's listen to her story. So before Jesus, my life was filled with a lot of uncertainty. I often felt like I had to um, make a way for myself in conversations or in circumstances and different situations. Um, I'd have a goal, I'd do everything I could to reach that goal, and then I'd get there, and it was not as exciting as I thought it was gonna be. And it was kind of one step forward, two steps back, and just an endless cycle of of trying to find fulfillment in, in the wrong places. I grew up in an agnostic family. My parents weren't Christians, and they didn't really have a faith background, but they were concerned for my education, so they put me in a Catholic school and um, that was in fourth grade and in Catholic school everyone had to go to religion class every day but I was so far behind because I had never been exposed to anything like that so when everyone else went to religion class I had to go have a one-on-one lesson with our our nun in that school and in that first lesson she put the Bible in front of me and she said this is Jesus and you're a sinner and he died for your sins and I thought I'm learning this at school so it must be true so at that point I accepted Christ but I really didn't have anyone to come alongside me and teach me the ways um, of living living for Jesus and what that meant. So it was quite a while before I um, really gave my whole life to Christ. And it was actually when I moved to Kansas City and I got my first job, there was a Christian at my, um, at my job and she invited me to a Bible study. And it was just a bunch of Christians getting together and studying John. And God really used that time to um, reveal to me truths of the scripture and uh, convict me of my own sin, and it was a huge, huge growing period for me. I could go on and on about the ways God is working in my life right now, but um, the biggest way I'm seeing God work in my life is just through daily obedience. When I um, got baptized a couple years ago and I rededicated my life to Christ, I was so on fire for God, I felt like I needed to do something huge to show my love for Him, and I, I could tell He was really just telling me to stay put, be faithful, and steward well over my current situation. So. I started getting up early and making my bed and working hard when I'm at work and just relentlessly studying the Word. And he has just really shown up through daily obedience. Um, I am getting married in December. I have had ample opportunities to share Christ with people I didn't have opportunities to before. Um, he's opened doors for me at work. It's really just been um, been amazing, everything that he's been doing for me in my life. And I've, I've gotten the opportunity and just the huge blessing to see people in my family come to Christ. And it's it's just been amazing. So it's important for Christians to share Jesus with others because it's our purpose. Before I really understood what my purpose was as a person or as a Christian, I I thought that my purpose was something, some mystery that I was going to have to spend my whole life trying to figure out. And it turns out it's actually not a mystery. It's pretty clear. God makes it clear to us. Our purpose is to lead other people to the Father. And it's only through uh, fulfilling that purpose that we're going to try, we're going to find true fulfillment. Our purpose isn't to be in a specific profession or even to be a father or a spouse. It's it's to lead other people to Jesus, and we do that through the spheres of influence that God has placed us in. We can spend our entire lives finding answers to the biggest questions that we have, but the reality is that in one way or another, we always are going to have to circle back around to Christ because nothing is going to bring us fulfillment, nothing is going to bring us purpose, and nothing is going to bring us joy and, and hope like Jesus will. Amen. What a powerful testimony. You've heard now the story of these individuals of Saul, Glenn Luke. This morning you heard the story of the paralytic and also of Kevin. Can I just ask you this morning, what's your story? Do you have a story of how you encounter Christ? Every one of us in this room were sinners. 
I don't believe I have to convince any of, that, any of you of that. We know we're broken. And we try to find the solution to our brokenness in all kinds of things, don't we? We look for it in a job. We look for it in a relationship. All kinds of things in this world. You know where it always brings us back to? It brings us back to a place of brokenness. God's only provided one solution to your brokenness, and it's Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. But if you will trust in him as your personal Lord and Savior, if you'll place your faith in him, today your sins can be forgiven you. You can have a new start, a fresh beginning, the Holy Spirit. Some of you are here today and you're probably thinking, well, I'm tired of being who I am. There's the opportunity today to be born again through faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit placed inside your heart and given purpose. You know, so many people come to Jesus because they want eternal life. Do you realize that Jesus came to give us eternal life? He came to also give us life here. Amen. To give us a sense of purpose and meaning and fulfillment. To live for something bigger than you. It's available to you today through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. God, we, we thank you that you have made the gospel message so crystal clear. And God, I pray that I haven't muddied the water this morning. God, I pray right now if there's anybody in this room that's lost and apart from hope in Christ, God, I pray today you would move in their life. God, we know that salvation is a divine work. I pray that right now in their heart you would convict them of their sin. With Saul, he had to confront his own sin. He thought he was a good person, but he was confronted with the glory of Christ, and he realized very quickly he was a sinner. He might have been pretty good compared to other people, but your judgments are not about comparing us to other people. It's about comparing us to the holiness of God. The paralytic, he might have thought he was a pretty good person, but he realized very quickly he needed the forgiveness of his sins. God, I pray that if there's anybody here that know you, convict them of their sin. But even more than that, point them to the only hope of salvation, which is Jesus. Paul said, Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ. I pray today you'd peel back the blinders on somebody's heart so that they would see Jesus. And they would be born again, forgiven, freed, and reborn. God, for those of us that do know you, I pray that we'd be reminded again of the wonder of the salvation that we've received. And God, I pray that we would go forth on mission for you. That we would be the kind of friends who are so concerned about the people around us that we start getting really creative and really risky in this gospel mission, knowing that when we're engaged with you in this mission, we never lose. We're on the winning team. God, help us to live on mission for you and to see people around us come to faith in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.